Corey was your typical seven-year-old boy in all ways except one major one. He was diagnosed with a rare type of cancer. He and his parents made the whirlwind trip to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, where they received the diagnosis. There, he was poked, prodded, and discussed ad nauseum by all the grown-ups. He had had it. His parents were exhausted and anxious, keeping up a brave face but knowing the facade could break open in an instant. Then one morning, Corey emerged wearing nothing but his hospital gown, giggling, dancing, and flashing his mom and dad. From our studios in Charlotte, North Carolina, this is the Psych Bites Podcast. The Psych Bites Podcast is where mental health professionals offer practical psychology to enhance your life. I'm Dr. Craig Pullman, uh, neurodevelopmental psychologist. (laughs) He's so smart. I'm Jennifer Feitz, licensed professional counselor. In this episode, we're talking about the psychology of humor. In the opening, you heard just part of the true story of Corey. After going through the history of humor, getting quizzed, and discussing science on humor, including its implications, you'll hear the rest of Corey's story. So we're talking humor today. My fave. Including tongue twisters. I was going to say, how many times do you say that a day? Wow. Yeah. Actually, probably not a lot. So... What kind of humor do you like? What's your how, how does your taste in humor run? So can I answer that question of saying what I know I don't like? Sure. Okay, so I don't like slapstick humor. Like, I don't like Jim Carrey. I think Dumb and Dumber, there's not an ounce of funny in the whole movie. Um, I would like to say I like intelligent humor. <laughs> I like humor for smart people. Um, I like witty banter, sarcasm, um, like British humor is mm-hmm. that an appropriate like that very quick witted. So who, who do you who do you like to watch or listen to? So my favorite stand up comic is Trevor Noah, hands down. Yeah, um, I've seen him on his show on the Daily oh. Show, but I so he started in stand up. I don't. I've oh, never seen him as stand up. He he started as a stand up comic, mm-hmm. um, and it's brilliant. It's brilliant because it's relatable, and he is so intelligent. And so then his humor, um, the way that he can start over here and end over here, but then, and you are like, where is this going? And then when he lands, I mean, it is just brilliant. Um, I love Brian Regan. I don't don't know. know. Oh, another super funny guy. I'm noticing as I'm even talking about this, a lot of it is everyday life stuff. Like the, the people that can find the humor in everyday Mm -hmm. life and circumstances, it's relatable. Like, I think that's the thing with slapstick humor. I'm like, how often are you going to, I don't don't know. I'm with you on slapstick, but every once in a while, some physical comedy will get me. Like one one of my favorite comic actors is Will Ferrell. And one one of my favorite comedy movies is, um, oh, I'm blanking. The one where they they go to school. They're... um, Oh, old school. Old school. Ah. Oh my gosh. Love that. That scene where, where he gets shot. Everybody in the go neck. running. Yeah, with that, yes. <laughs> We're going streaking. So they are going to go streaking. When he gets shot in the neck with a dart gun. Yes. That, that's okay. hysterical. So, And I am one of those weird people that laugh when somebody gets hurt. <laughs> like, as I mean, as, if they're really hurt, I don't. I mean, mm-hmm. I choose to believe that actually as a good trauma therapist, I like jump in. But if you're okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to laugh at you. So what? So Desert Island, you had to take one comedy movie with you. What would it be? Okay, you're going to laugh at me, or you're going to think it's weird. No pun intended. So Steel Magnolias. What? Okay, here's the thing. Do you recognize how funny? <laughs> I'm going to go with Sophie's Choice. <laughs> <laughs> it's an oxymoron. But do you realize how funny that movie is? The dialogue, particularly between Olympia Dukakis' character and Shirley MacLaine, so Weeza and Clary, is so brilliant. And that's the beauty of that movie is it's so gut-wrenchingly tragic, but yet the way that they weave the humor allows I, you to stay with it. I think you're I've cheating. Been. Nope. I think you're trying to squeeze a chick flick onto the desert island when you can, you're can. you only allowed a comedy. I, yeah, for sure. I'm I'm taking Wedding Crashers. I really do you like, know I've never seen that movie? It is so funny. I really yeah. like Vince Vaughn as well, and he's in old school as well. Okay. And... Um, the the chemistry between um, Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn in that yeah. movie it's just it's amusing from start to finish and there's also I guess I, I like 
I like uh, smart ass humor. Yeah. And Vince Vaughn is a great smart ass. But there's also with just a little bit of physical comedy. There's a scene in that movie where they play touch football and oh, it's it's really it's hysterical. I take mine back real quick and this is a Shameless plug for the movie Game Night. Have you seen the movie Game Night? That's hysterical. With Jay- oh. Yes, and they're performing the surgery. The, so that to get the scene bo- in the parking oh, it goes lot. All the way I mean, hi. <laughs> and again, it's the banter between he and his wife. Like they're just sitting there in a parking lot. I mean, yes, she's doing this, but like the back and forth between the two of them. Right. I want to know to this day how much of that was actually scripted versus not just the two of them going back and That's forth. That's a fascinating thing about comedy. And oh. we're going to get to the sort of the intelligence of mm-hmm. comic actors and mm-hmm. how fast they can process information yeah so since you brought up um that movie night game, game night, night game night um I, I love jason bateman and to me he's the pitch perfect straight man so i like oh, comedy yeah. where there's a really good straight man or straight woman which was funny have you ever seen will ferrell's movie where he plays a straight man through the whole thing um stranger than fiction no that's the one where oh. he's he, he's, a, he's, like a, a he's an irs he's no he's right? a, well he's in a book but he's an irs auditor and it is so intriguing to me because it's a phenomenal movie. It's got big time actors and actresses in it, but he plays a straight man through the whole thing, and it's so intriguing to watch. Like king of goofy comedy. Be so, brilliant. so we're gonna later in this episode, we're gonna talk about how humor can be used clinically. Yes, in in therapy, very intentionally. So let let's just. Let's just give a little, little teaser about that. So just a, what are just a few thoughts about how you use humor, comedy, whatever, in your therapy practice? Um, I believe that the ability to have a sense of humor is a sign of mental health, right? It's mm-hmm. showing cognitive and emotional flexibility, sort of psychological flexibility. So I try to use that both modeled within like I try to model it even laughing at myself a little bit but then also encouraging others to be able to get to the point that they can maybe find the levity in a circumstance Mm -hmm. um irreverent humor so very intentional humor meant to try to draw attention to um maybe some irrational thinking or behavior Mm -hmm. um is something that I use pretty regularly but as a honed Skill. I mean, it's something that if we were doing like supervision with a younger a younger clinician, we would be careful mm-hmm. about that because you can do damage if you're not careful. Mm-hmm. I'll have some more thoughts to share as well, but I, I would I would say for me, humor is great for forging relationships. Mm-hmm. There's something about shared laughter and uh, the, the, just creating a connection. It's mm-hmm. really powerful. I would agree. So, as usual in this episode, we're going to go through a timeline, and Brandon Gage, our producer. Uh, did some great research for us, and so let, we're gonna get, get the, out of my screen, Gage. Is he back there? He is. He's waving. Is he on screen for you. I got nothing but the calendar behind me. If you're watching this, on I video. got nothing but the calendar. All right, so um, yeah, so let's go through the history of humor. Love it. So humor has been an aspect of the experience of modern Homo sapiens for thousands of years. I I can't. <laughs> Why don't you say homo sapiens with a straight face? It's good. You're going to say it too. <laughs> Humor's conversation has been observed by anthropologists when making first contact with Australian aboriginals. And it appears that aboriginals have been essentially genetically isolated for at least 35,000 years. If genetic factors dictate the fundamental ability to perceive or produce humor, then homo sapien... Here you go. <laughs> I just said hopo. Hopo sapien. Humor is at least 35,000 years old. That's That goes back. So it goes back a long way. That, that's at least, old. At a minimum. We would say retro. Vintage. Uh, okay. Do you remember the movie Quest for Fire? It came out no. late 70s, early 80s, and it is about I was a cavemen. Wee, I was a wee babe, old man. It, well, there is this thing called Netflix. <laughs> You could have come Touche. across it. It Touche. could have showed up on TNT. Touche. Um, but the, the what the interesting thing about the movie was that there's no dialogue and no no subtitles. It's just cavemen back in the day. Oh, that's funny. Kind of just you know communicating gutturally and through sign language and everything. And and, and the they're trying this one tribe. They're trying to find fire. Like their fire's 
and they don't have the the tools. Whatever. So they have to go find some fire somewhere from some lightning. And there's a scene in there where they laugh. Something funny happens and they laugh. So I'm just imagining, you know, when I'm seeing 35,000 years ago, I'm imagining cave people well, stubbing a toe and thinking it's hysterical. Well, when I introduce the concept, especially to clients of mine who struggle with emotional regulation, I go all the way back, like to caveman brain, to primal emotions and the right. fact that we had a few of them and, and the ability to be happy. Like that's in there. That goes all the way back. So that has got to come right. it's with in a our sense software. of humor. It is. So ancient Greek texts describe professional jesters and joke books. So I guess you could earn a living back back then. Well, didn't they? Jokes. Wasn't that a court thing? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. One of the earliest individuals to be firmly associated with humor and laughter was the Greek philosopher Democritus, who was born around 460 B.C., he formulated an atomic theory of the universe and is known as the laughing philosopher. Huh. He had a reputation for his mirthful disposition and for his tendency to laugh at the stupidity <laughs> of fellow citizens. So he's like a big bang theory guy <laughs> coming up with all this cool stuff at the universe and then all the morons out there he thinks are hysterical. Democritus, the ability to laugh shout at out. other. Well, I was about to say, there is your stupid human fact for the day. Who was known as the laughing philosopher? In 1637, Thomas Morton of Marymount wrote New English Canon, which contained chapters comparing his observations of native people and English. English. <laughs> I, can't, what is that? I can't speak of the English this morning all that well. English Puritans, including their cultural values. So in the timeline here, this looks to be one of the earliest forms of political humor, political social commentary. Mm -hmm. like, so once again, com Tom, comparing Tom Morton is kind of like a. I don't Did know, you like just Trevor call him Noah. Tom like he's your friend? Yeah, Tom, Tom Morton. Tommy and I go way back. Tommy M to 1637. So sometime around 1680, Benjamin Church wrote. <laughs> I can't say this. <laughs> entertaining passages from King Philip's War which discussed the foolish tactics and needless tragedies of the conflict. So, so he was taking sad circumstances right. and trying to create some humor out and of it. And just skewering it. And this all, mm -hmm. We don't have it in a timeline here, and I'm, off the top of my head, I can't think of where it would fit, but Jonathan Swift's A Modest oh. Proposal. Yeah. Somewhere kind of around there, give or take a century, where he's writing this modest Five proposal years. that they, just start, they should just start eating all the homeless children in in, uh, in England to solve the homeless problem and you know cure starvation or whatever. So there's your uplifting fact for the day. We got more coming. It <laughs> is it is an episode on comedy. Mark Twain, R.I.P. Born 1835 and died in 1910, is considered a founding figure in creating an American voice and humor. His comedic short story, The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County, released in 1865, was one of his first successes that brought him national attention. And now we have the Mark Twain Award for Humor. That's right. Every year. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we could just uh, kind of continue with the timeline from there. We got silent movies, Charlie Chaplin. Mm -hmm. We got radio. Um, the, who are those three, three idiot brothers? Three Stooges. The, the Stooges and, the, speaking of brothers, the Marx Brothers. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Do you watch the show? I think it's on Amazon, the, the, fa the Marvelous Mrs. Meisel. Oh, my gosh. My husband is low-key obsessed with that show and was so, so excited. So but that's kind of I've about the emergence of, of yes, females female. in the comedy yep. front. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, Lorne Michaels on SNL, he credits uh, female cast members really kind of keeping the show afloat throughout the whole oh, the century. Yeah. The whole, the odds really belong to the women like Tina Fey. And oh, my gosh. Amy Poehler. Well, and the original Gilda Radner. Right. Who we're going to shout out later. Yeah. But Rest in peace. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. So more to come. Lots to discuss about humor. We're going to get into... Um, kind of the science behind humor, what happens in the brain. Which with I'm humor. very excited about. Yeah, because it's, it's I think it's for a stuff. lot of us, we can see it and we sort of know in the back of our head that there's certain aspects of it that are related to the brain and intelligence and things like that. But I'm excited to hear you break and, it down for us and more about the clinical uses of therapy. I'm very curious to see how you use it in therapy. So we will dis we will resume our discussion shortly. <laughs> All 
Our quiz master extraordinaire, Mara Thiel, couldn't join us this episode. So we're bringing in somebody off the bench. Jonathan Hederle is here. Hederle, as we like to call him, is a therapist and writer with an above average sense of humor. If we were to uh, up for debate. If we were to plot his his humor quotient, think of the bell curve. I would definitely put him in the upper half of the expected range, top half. Okay, so Hederly, I, 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 I like above. you, but I feel like this is still up for debate. This is based on what is your sense of humor. I've collected data. I've known him for years, so... Yeah, but the audience can decide and feel free to comment. Okay. I also would like to point out that I feel I am now today at an unfair advantage because Hederly likes you better, and I think he's going to give you points. I don't think he likes me very much, so you're screwed. He's got a huge file on me. Apparently, he's done all this data analysis. Data analysis Mm -hmm. and research. I love how we're talking about him like he's not here. (laughs) Yeah, seriously. Wow. Thanks for being here, dude. Okay. What do you got for us? Well, so today's topic is all about humor, and I've decided— not to do a quiz today. Instead, you both will be doing an impromptu stand-up comedy routine, and I get to decide who the winner is. Just kidding! <laughs> Humor, how huh? Funny, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. Today's quiz is going to be focused... I was over here in my head going, okay, what do I got? Yeah. What material do I have? And she's like... Blood pressure rising. Literally told Craig, and he already knows I know, his routine. I was like, you've got that shit-eating grin over there. He Why knew. We should have made her go through with it, oh. and then... Yeah. His grin is. You're does. blushing, though, because you feel bad. You said he has a shit-eating grin? Oh, have you ever heard that phrase? You got a shit-eating grin? Like, when you know something, like, oh. Just the idea of, like, take that too literally. You've never heard that phrase? No. What? We don't swear in our house. My mom never swears. Julie's parents don't swear. Dude, a well-placed shit or F-bomb is key, to, in my opinion, to a good sense of humor. Well, I don't shy away from vulgar humor. I just don't practice it at my house. So, But anyhow, today's quiz is going to be focused on comedy, specifically comedy terms, movies, and comedians. Mm. As always, apparently... Uh, Answers to the question to the answer the questions to the best of your abilities. And if you both completely bomb, I will award points to my favorite answer mm-hmm. person, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Completely unbiased, right? Yes. Uh. All right. Okay. The first question In the world of comedy, what does a flop? Sweat mean, Craig. Flop sweat. I think it is that state of anxiety going into a gig that you're not going to do very well or be very funny with the audience. Okay. Look at you using like psychological terms. It's the sweat that starts to happen on your forehead when you're putting jokes out there and they're flopping. It's like oh, this is not going well, and you start to, yes, get anxious. But it's right here in particular. Oh, that's right. a more specific yeah. version of my answer. So yours is really leading up to, and yours is during. And, 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 and mine oh, is yeah. more for the general sense, yeah. and yours is... Yours is, I was always understood that term to mean it was what happened when you got out there, and it was like, oh, okay. this isn't going well. So, fights is absolutely correct. A flop sweat is the overabundance of perspiration one experiences from a panic reaction to bombing. <laughs> Woo woo! Right. Five points to fights. I can overcome that. Oh, All right. Thank you, Harley. I appreciate that. Question two is multiple choice. Oh, okay, good. Whew. What is the highest total grossing comedy film of all time? Now, this includes comedy and family comedies, but it does not include action adventure comedy animated comedy, or romantic comedy. And is this like box office or then purchased like at Target? Purely box office. Purely box office. All right. Is it The Hangover? Is it Home Alone? Is it Meet the Fockers? Or is it Bruce Almighty? Fights, you can go first this time. Okay, so I have to give a shout out. Everyone assumes, based on the household that I grew up in, that when my husband started dating me, that we were like a living version of Meet the Fockers. Oh, yeah? People are always like, that was just like what it was when you and Jen. I was like, no. Um, the first one was The Hangover and then Home Alone. Yep, then Meet the Fockers, Fockers and, and then Bruce, Bruce Almighty. I'm going Home Alone. I'm going B. Okay, Home, home Alone. alone. 
I know that for a while that was the top grossing movie of all time. It actually beat out Batman the year later, but it's mm-hmm. I, I think it's I think it's been overtaken. I, I'm gonna there's a red herring in here that I'm gonna go with. I think it's Bruce Almighty. Bruce Almighty. Ugh. Jim Carrey. So the highest total grossing comedy film of all time is Home Alone. Dang it. The first one. The second one lost in New York. Didn't Not do so this much as well. I need to give a shout out though because I'm I'm really hating on Jim Carrey. His political satire art. Have you have you guys seen mm-hmm. this? The art, like the visual art that he's producing, that's all political satire, is is brilliant, hmm. and is there's my small. Plug. I think he and Craig have aged in the same manner, like the tightening of the face and various distinguished wrinkles. Like you, you have wise wrinkles, Craig. Like well earned wrinkles, not like poor gene, you know, wrinkles. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you know what is a good thing? Your laugh lines. You know what is really funny though? Because I was going to say I feel that you have both aged gracefully, but I guarantee you, Jim Carrey has like been Botoxed and cut upon and whatnot, and you're just naturally as far as you know aging like a fine yeah. wine. It's it's the good Botox. <laughs> it's the vegan. It's Botox. nice that the two of you are complimenting me because I'm getting my ass kicked. You're you trying are. to lift me up here. Yeah. Standard. Ten, ten more points to fights. It's 15 nil. I hear the Rocky theme. All right. Da-da-da. Let's go to question number three. Okay. If a comedian is hammocking, oh. what is he or she doing? Craig. Oh, shit. What okay. is hammocking? Um, I got nothing. I, I'm thinking... Um, uh, something like with a banana sling. You're doing oh. some sort of underwear humor. I'm going to go with that. You're okay. Like, yeah. Underwear humor. Banana and underwear humor. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go with hammocking. Why not? I'm going to go mm, with stealing other people's stuff. Like laying down on the job. I'm being lazy. I'm just stealing other people's material. Okay. I think you both are wrong. both wrong. Yeah. I, think I was going to say. I think <laughs> but who's wrong. least wrong? Yeah. A gentleman just walking by with red pants is the most wrong in this situation. (laughs) Um, He is hammocking. Hammocking is a technique for placing weaker material or improvising between two strong comedy bits. Oh. The hammocking. That would sort of make sense. Like I get it like hanging the hammock. mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the fact that Craig brought up a banana and, you know, I'm going to give him points for that. Um 30 points for Craig for that. All right. I so knew, we've I overtaken knew that you. So what, are going to so what, win, not because you get an answer correct. What, what, I've got 15 what, points what, right now, and you have 30 what, for getting it wrong. Oh, that's the score? I was going to ask what the score was. Yeah, 15 so, you to 30. Knew exactly so who has 30? The, yeah, you I, do. You Why? Because you have a what? I have 15, you have 30, or because, is it the other way around? Why because do you it, have more points than uh, me when you have not answered a question correctly? Why do you think it is? Because he has a penis. Uh, we need verification, judges, on that. Oh, let's ask the other two penises in the room. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Oh my! I think you've overestimated the penis count. It in this could room. be my chiseled <laughs> face. I'm I glad. Being it. Very I'm very sincere. I'm glad the word face came after chiseled. <laughs> after all of that cock talk. <laughs> This is taken and an absolute turn for the worse. I was speaking on so many levels. Yeah, in, kind of bent. Right, and the score We've, sucks too. <laughs> All right, well, let's move on. See if we can't even the uh, score, right? All right. Please. The next question is multiple choice again. <sighs> Fun fact. Our podcast is hosted in Charlotte, North Carolina. But do you know which classic comedian film star was born in North Carolina? Is it Charlie Chaplin? Is it Lou Costello? Is it Jerry Lewis? Oh. Or is it Andy Griffith? Oh. All right, Fightsy. You're living up to your name here. More your tenacity and bite than you are with your score. But let's find out of those four choices. D. Andy Griffith. D. Andy Griffith. That's certainly the most logical answer. I've never heard anything about those other guys. I'm going to go... If we're going to be wrong, we're going to be wrong together, and I can... Don't try to piggyback on me. Maintain my lead. Yeah. Griffith. D. It is Andy Griffith. 
I got it right first. 45 points matter. to each of you. So we're at 75 to 60. Ooh, we're going into the last question. It's it's neck and neck. Anybody's ball game. I'm going to ring Except somebody's yours. neck. I'm going to ring some necks. No. Like we're not going to you're not going to be able to quote unquote um, piggyback off fights. The last question not a multiple choice. Coming the question is this. Some comedians built their careers off off of blue comedy. But what exactly is blue comedy? Craig. I think it's comedy that um it's, tr- uh, it's trying to to it's it's built off of somebody's troubles. Somebody's troubles. Okay. Fight. I'm going with like the blue collar comedy, like um, what was his name? The one that used to do if you might be a redneck, Jeff if Foxworthy. Jeff Foxworthy, and then the guy, Larry the Cable Guy, that was also Mater, right? In, mm-hmm. his in, name cars. Is in cars, Larry the Cable Guy. Larry the Cable Guy, right? That was. I'm going with like blue collar, like making jokes out of the blue okay. collar. And what was yours again, Craig? Uh, based on people's troubles, the troubles. Blues. Okay, the blues, the troubles. Well, you're both wrong. Wow. Okay. So blue comedy is comedy that is risque, Uh, indecent, mm. profane, and largely about sex. It often contains profanity or sexual imagery that may shock and offend audience members. (laughs) Kind of like what we've been using here during this episode. Now, Craig brought up troubles, and a lot of men have sexual troubles, so we're going to give Craig this one. Of course. For 200 points. I knew it. I knew it. That's a lot. That's Can I get a total out of the back for who has won the points wise? What did I have before? Since 75? the beginning. Two, 200 and I think my total is 275. What what's your total fights? Where are you at? To one? Mm-hmm. To, that's a landslide. Mm-hmm. Do we have any more questions? Mm-hmm. That is it. So we have a comedy winner, <laughs> and it clearly is me. Of these three. Uh, I would like to point out that I actually got more questions correct. We need to rethink where you plot here. Uh Uh-huh. Who got the most questions right, Greg? I, you know, lots happened since we had the quiz. Mm -hmm. and Revisionist history. um, Surprise, surprise. The score is the score. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Hederly. That was awesome. Thanks for stepping in. Earlier, you mentioned Gilda Radner. Mm. So awesome. And she had this great line. What comedy is, it's hitting on the truth before the other guy thinks of it. (laughs) So great. She was so brilliant. And, you know, that that made me think about uh, the psychology of comedy and how smart comic actors and and stand-up comics are. And, and just people that you know are funny, they can think so fast. Yeah. I think it gets underestimated, too, by the way. Well, maybe we can change that. Yeah. There's actually a component of an intelligence framework called Cattell Horn Carroll, or CH- CHC, for processing speed. Wait, say, okay. So, so there are theories of, of IQ, of intelligence, right, right, that right. incorporates thinking speed. Processing speed. So, so people with uh, with you know they're really funny, and and we've all we've experienced this, right? Like yeah, you think of the uh, like a funny thing to say mm-hmm. the next day, yes, or an hour later, or five minutes. But someone who's really funny, they can think of the perfect funny thing to say in the moment, which I'm so jealous of because sometimes I can do that, and then I always I'm mostly the person that thinks of it later. But I think what's so interesting about what you are starting to highlight is usually we would consider sense of humor and EQ. To fall like into emotional quotient, like social skills and your ability to right. relate. But really, it has its underpinnings in IQ. Right. So, so like their actual intelligence quotient. So this has been looked at, interestingly. So in 2012, there was a study that compared stand-up comedians to college students. And comedians <laughs> showed higher verbal intelligence. That makes a lot of sense. And to go further, in, in 2017, there's another study where participants were asked. I thought this was really interesting. They are asked to generate... Funny punchlines to caption removed cartoons. So 
Like you know, they would just like, take a cartoon with no right. words. So and just then, characters yeah, yeah, with, yeah, yeah. with bubbles, and then they had to come up with something funny there, oh. and then it was rated somehow. So intelligence, so they also gave IQ tests. Intelligence predicted humor production capacity. That's what they're calling that ability to come up with the funny line for the little uh, cartoon blurb. And variance was explained by divergent thinking and crystallized intelligence. And I should okay, explain gonna, that. Yeah, so, I was going to say you're going to have to break those so down. So crystallized intelligence is... It's kind of what you learn. It's long-term memory. You've accrued that over time. So mm-hmm. someone could have inserted some blurbs in there that they remember, that they maybe from a movie or other okay. stuff. So they've stored up a lot of stuff. But the divergent thinking fluency, that's being able to come up with a lot of ideas at once. Divergent thinking, different directions, and, and fluency to be able to do it quickly. So what they're saying here in the study is that the people who could come up with those funny lines from an intelligence perspective, had both a lot of knowledge and the capacity to fire off ideas quickly, new ideas, novel ideas. So it's, it's a combination of new stuff and stuff you've acquired through experience. See, this is so interesting because as I was th- sitting here thinking, I thought, you know, the class clown, being the class clown, is a very, you know, it has a negative connotation to it. But I wonder what would happen if teachers would begin to recognize that these kids who are finding humor and using humor and are able to do it on the fly in the moment that that was a sign of intelligence right and and okay we've got to like give a shout out that like it you know usually the class clown is doing it at inappropriate times or for too long or you know and we know that it can sometimes be to distract from other stuff going on but like what would happen if a teacher were to say you know what that kid has base intelligence has high this or well honed that and use it or utilize that in a kind of way, channel it for that kid as opposed to just them being the kid that's always Clamping getting in trouble. It, yeah. Right. right. But harnessing I, it. Harnessing, harnessing the power it for good. Yes. Strength-based teaching. So you may answer this later, but one other question that was battling in my head is, so we know that it requires intelligence to create humor. Is there any research that talks about then what type of intelligence can understand humor quickly? Like for, get for sure. the witty – the witty one-off came, you know, when like sort of nobody else is paying attention. They're like, oh, that was funny. For sure. So, so first, let's sort of differentiate. There's there's being funny, right? Which in the research is called humor production, coming up with the jokes, and then there's having a sense of humor, which is interpreting humor. Which are two very different things. That's right. And from a neurodevelopmental perspective, that's akin to the difference between expressive language, taking your thoughts and putting them into words, whether you're putting them into words, whether you're talking or writing, and receptive language, being able to understand yeah. and that's those are those related but separate abilities and they unfold diff- at different speeds mm-hmm. you can think of babies they learn to understand before they can communicate when you're learning a foreign language oh, that's a good way to put it. it's easier to understand that language you understand that language first before you're able to, to speak it fluently that's so interesting is but that this is how we this, there's like a lag okay so okay i, lo- I love being edumacated by you craig so, so now so this is funny word time oh god what okay. let me let me ask you. Okay. What is the there's a word for the study of laughter and its psychological and physiological effects. What is that word? What is that term? The study of humor and its psychological effects. Technically a study of laughter. I got I got to tell you. Can I say? I was going to say cuz I'm trying to come up with like the Greek word for laughter or It's so much fun to say. Gelotology. <laughs> G-E-L-O-T-O-L-O-G-Y, Jellotology. Jellotology is the, is the study of jello wrestling. You would think. You <laughs> or would think. how many jello shots you can actually consume on yeah. spring break. But for reals, Jellotology <laughs> was pioneered. Gelotology. That is not a thing. It is. No, pi- William F. Fry of Stanford University. Oh, God That's bless. Go trees. That's a thing. Um, has done a lot of research in this. And so let me, let me tell you about a little bit of research, and this gets to that, that question you asked about interpreting stuff. So they did research with an, uh, with an EEG, or an electroencephalogram. That's where, you know, you put the electrodes on the scalp, and it's registering yeah, yeah, yeah. what's going on, yeah, yeah, it's firing yeah. away. So they found that within 0.4 ten, within four tenths of a second, of exposure to something potentially funny, Mm -hmm. maybe a sight gag or whatever, an electrical wave moved through the cerebral cortex, cortex, so just firing up everywhere. If the wave took a negative charge, there was laughter. 
if it, if it maintained a positive charge, there were no response was given. So this is kind of interesting that we think of comedy as like a funny thing. Yeah. But it actually creates a negative charge in the brain just from, a, from an electrochemical standpoint. Can you give me a quick understanding of what a negative charge versus a positive charge? It's just charge? like think of uh, – you know, uh, middle well, school chemistry. Yeah, like, yeah. Well, no, I mean, I. But it's just electrons firing rather than than uh, uh, positrons. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. See. All right. It's been a long time since so, middle school. So the left side of the cortex. You know, the cortex is what you know the, yeah, the yeah, brain yeah. matter. Yeah. Okay, so the left yep. side of the brain. Um, that side fired up more when words were being analyzed and the structure of the joke. Makes sense. Being, so left, that's that's the language hemisphere. center, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Left hemisphere. And the frontal lobe, which is just right behind our, our eyebrows, right? Our noggin. That's that's that was very active for the social emotional response. Well, that makes sense joke. considering that's where Doesn't our it? yep. Yep. Higher order thinking, social thinking. Now the right hemisphere. Our artsy side. There you go. That is, and it's also the logic center, and that carried out the intellectual analysis that required to really get the joke. Yeah. Oh, that so, makes so much sense. So we're seeing the firing here happen left side mm -hmm. to get the, the language structure, front frontal lobe to get the emotional response, and then the, the right side is really get the joke. And then, okay, it gets even cooler. Then the brainwave activity moves to the back of the head to what we call the occipital lobe. Caveman brain. That handles the visual process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's where you start to see the humor. Visualize oh. it. Okay. This is so interesting. And then finally, the motor sections, and there's a strip that goes down, you know, the mm -hmm. the um, mm -hmm. the the yeah, yeah, yeah. side of the cortex. Yeah. That's where you get the physical response to the joke. That's so interesting. Like bending over and slapping a thigh. See, oh, oh, okay. This is so interesting because what you're talking about, though, we rarely use both hemispheres of our brain together at the same time. But you're basically saying that this is an all brain process humor right. requires humor goes all brain. everywhere it goes everywhere yep what an excellent like metaphor for humor humor can go all places to all people at all times i but feel I, like there's some sort of but i think that yeah, i really like your, your comment about how kids who are or just people who are mm -hmm. disparaged for their humor mm -hmm. and you have to have conversations about appropriateness and setting but mm -hmm. knowing that Humor is a as an intellectual activity that really affects a lot of different brain centers. That's a totally different conversation. It could be a much more positive conversation. Well, I think we underestimate or people do not pay attention to the fact that having a sense of humor, you know, the ability to produce humor, the ability to understand humor is a sign of intelligence. And so if you're thinking about approaching things from a strengths-based perspective, like anytime somebody comes into my office. I want to know what they're good at. What is it that you feel like you're good at? Before I start doing EMDR with like a trauma patient, we start with front loading from a mastery perspective, right? And so if you're looking at somebody and you say, wow, they've got a sense of humor. Wow, they can, like they're funny as in they can produce the humor or man, they are quick to laugh at a joke, right? Jovial to be around. I would say that's a strength. Somewhere I can use that. I can tap into that and maybe help them almost like a graft Right. I mean, this is kind of a, a yucky metaphor, but like skin grafts, right? We take healthy and we put it over onto unhealthy. We could say, okay, how can I use this to then maybe build on an area of, of weakness or opportunity? And I just think it gets underestimated all the time. Speaking of senses of humor, oh, all right. Lord. Okay. Brandon Gage, our, our producer, also did some research for us into types of humor. All okay. Right. This is this is really cool. This stuff. is interesting because this is what we were talking about earlier of like what kind of humor do we like? That's right. That's okay. Right. So psychologist Rod Martin and his colleagues studied four types of humor: affiliative, aggressive, self-enhancing, and self-defeating. Mm. Uh, self-defecating, I guess, didn't make the cut. They then <laughs> developed a humor styles questionnaire that can measure these senses of humor. It is a 32-item self-report inventory that identifies how individuals use humor in their own lives. So let's go through these four types. Okay, so affiliative humor is used to enhance relationships in a benevolent, positive manner. It's a way to charm and amuse others, as well as ease tension among groups. Individuals with this type of humor often tell spontaneous jokes, participate in witty banter, and enjoy laughing with others. This is the person that can work a room. Yes. Yes. And, 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 and maybe in sort of a sweet way, 
Yes. But it's the idea because I keep thinking of different types of people, Mm -hmm. right? And so this is the person that could probably be in sales, right? Because they can quickly sort of assimilate, be warm with others, earn their trust. Yeah. Like this is, that's that person. Yeah. I I don't get the sense that this is the type of person who needs to uh, own every joke. Like they're they're just as happy sitting there and laughing at what other people. people are saying as they are making other people laugh. Yes. All right, so self-enhancing humor is the ability to laugh at yourself, your circumstances, and the idiosyncrasies in life. It's about an overall good-natured attitude toward life. This style is typically used by individuals to enhance the self in a benevolent, positive manner. Think Mm -hmm. of it as a coping or emotional regulation humor, you know, looking at the bright side of a a bad situation. So this is the, oh, what's that great... Always look on the, the bright, bright side, side of life. Do 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 do. Do you not know how to whistle? I, I need to wet my whistle for it. Always okay. Shout out to spam a lot. Okay, aggressive humor. Guarantee you, this is going to be my least favorite. Is potentially detrimental towards others. This is not funny, people. <laughs> this usually involves sarcasm, put downs, teasing, criticism, ridicule, all at the expense of others. At times, this humor may seem playful and fun, but the underlying intent may be to harm or belittle others. So, sarcasm. Yeah. Right. I have it like sign of intelligence, always effective, never helpful. Right. And right? the other quote uh, sarcasm is the defense of the weak. Ooh, mic drop. Yeah. If you could drop your mic. Yeah, this is, um, yeah, th- our producer, Sean, would not like us to I drop know. These do mics. not mic, do not mic drop. Yeah. It's interesting in family Arrange therapy it. all the time. One of the <laughs> things that I'll do is an exercise to help people understand their communication style. Mm-hmm. And it's funny, if ever, if you were ever to say to somebody, are you passive aggressive? I mean, most people would maybe be honest and answer that question, but most of the time they'd be like, oh, no. But sarcasm is 100% rooted in passive aggressiveness. Yes, but this is making me think of a linguistic concept called code switching. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, and I have the conversations with my 15-year-old son about code switching all the time. So he will come out of, you know, a time hanging out with his buddies or his soccer teammates, and he'll come and he'll start talking to me or his mother (laughs) or his eight-year-old brother as if we're other 15-year-olds. And I'd say, you need to switch gears, dude. Yeah. Because I am not someone that you talk to like that. Yeah. It's okay to talk like that with your buddies, Mm -hmm. but you need to switch your code. And I think aggressive humor, for adolescent boys at least, is very common. all the time. And and, and there it's not so much the defense of the week. It's just how they're kind of like they're, it's the way they're, they're butting their antlers, you know? Yeah. So anthropologically, this is appropriate. Yeah. So so there 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 are forms for all of these uh, humor in life. But I, you know, and I can see that, and you could say, but I would say that probably your son, and even like I think that my son, who's who's younger than yours, but who's working his way up that ladder, use it, and they don't realize they're using it. Right. I'm having a really hard time thinking about when this is okay. Well, okay. Never Aggressive mind. humor. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's the most problematic for sure. So let's yeah. talk about this 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 last one here, self-defeating humor. It's characterized by the use of potentially detrimental humor towards the self in order to gain approval from others. So this often comes in the form of pleasing others by being the butt of the joke. Essentially, it's laughter at the individual's own expense. Now, this, I have a thought about this, but go yeah. ahead. No, give, share your thought. Well, I was going to say, I think I would say if somebody was sitting in my office and doing this, I make note of that and consider it to be clinical uh, information, right? Because I Mm -hmm. would immediately say, okay, this person can laugh at themselves, but are they laughing at their own expense to cover up something deeper? Right. Like that self-deprecating humor. I mean, it's great to be able to laugh at yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, I rarely get embarrassed and I think it's because I I just have learned that I do stupid shit all the time. And so I had to learn to like laugh at myself. But that when people use a lot of self-deprecating humor, that it usually is masking something deeper. The, the other pitfall that I would see with this is using it in an ill-advised way for social means to sort of gain entry. Uh. And I mean – one downsmanship is fine up to a point, but you know, I, I guess I'm kind of I'm thinking of sort of the, the meek person who maybe is getting bullied yeah. and tries to lean in 
on the humor so much mm -hmm. that they start putting themselves down and then, you know, just, just to be one of the cool kids. Yeah. To be accepted. Yeah. That they, that they get to be the butt of the joke. Yeah. It, but they turn out to be a, a sicko fan in a way. This is... Do you, you ever see the somewhat stupid movie called Accepted? It had some pretty good... Like, it had... Um, I don't think I did. Oh, who is the guy that was in, like, Wolves of Wall Street, not Leonardo DiCaprio, but the other one? He's become... Oh, jo Jonah Hill? Yes. He's in this movie as, like, a young actor. Blake Lively's in this movie. Oh, this um, is new. No. This, this is what I mean. These are before all of these guys had actually made their mark. So there's a oh, bunch of younger... Like when they were younger, but but what'd you say his name is Jonah Hill? He plays that exact role mm -hmm. throughout this whole movie, and then has his little bit of an awakening right. towards the end or whatever. But that's him. If you're looking for an example of what yeah. you just described, it's a pretty funny movie. I'm also thinking of Le Few from Beauty and the Beast. Oh, much better reference. Yeah. Josh Gad for right. the live action one. Right. Do you know what Le Few stands for? In the French? fool. Well done. Look at you. Stole my thunder. Damn. So, all right, so in just a little bit, let's pick up our discussion about clinical uses of humor. You, you've mentioned some things about mm -hmm. how you can assess people. Mm -hmm. I've got some more thoughts about that and how we can use it also to bolster uh, folks' resilience and outlook uh -huh. on life. Uh -huh. Lots more to come. Clinical uses of humor. Mm -hmm. So fights, let, let's, to kind of structure our discussion here, we might think of it in, in two ways. First is assessing mm -hmm. through humor mm -hmm. or with humor, mm -hmm. using humor to assess. Mm -hmm. And then there's more the treatment mm -hmm. therapy. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned a few things. Maybe we could talk more about how, how, how do you use humor, someone's sense of humor, to assess them, to read them, to figure out what's going on, read between the lines? Well, it's something that I will... First of all, I should say it's one thing that I pay attention to when somebody is coming in to describe what is potentially bringing them in for therapy. They will say, I have lost my sense of humor, mm. right? So right they there. will be able to acknowledge, usually due to irritability, like I, things that I used to find funny, I, I, don't have a, I don't have a sense of humor anymore. I've become really short and irritable, you know, so I think sometimes people can recognize it, right? Or on the vice versa of that, especially when I'm dealing with, with like adolescents and their parent, maybe they will begin to use medication, for either anxiety or depression or mood stability, something along those lines, I will say to the parents, begin to pay attention to whether or not their sense of humor comes back, right? So it's a demarcator of both that I have a problem or that my problem is beginning to diminish if my sense of humor either leaves or returns. So I think that speaks to this idea of, of social and emotional and intellectual intelligence that if it's disappearing or increasing, that we're getting back to maybe equilibrium for whatever this person was. So, you, so you're talking about diagnostically up front, but also monitoring treatment progress. Yes, that's really interesting. Yes. So, and and it will be one of the things that if a medication, especially for a person struggling with anxiety, depression, will be one of the first things to come back. Which I think is, I love to laugh. Like I just love to have a good time, and I think that just fundamentally feels good to me to know that that's one of the first things to return for a person. Um, I think that I begin to notice, you know, and, and I hate to say it, but intelligence matters to me to have an understanding of where I need to meet my client at, that idea of meeting them where they are, right? If I have a person that is presenting as extremely intelligent, I know that I can take some of our work in a specific type of direction. Right, linguistically, um, using more abstract concepts to try to teach them things, using metaphors and out, right? Like, so if I have somebody come in and I recognize that they have a sense of humor and they can both create humor or laugh at something, so I will sometimes intentionally weave humor into our first couple of sessions to see where a person is. And, and so maybe I'm just not funny, or they maybe to them. don't. <laughs> Or maybe they don't have a sense of humor. So, I mean, I think I use it, I mean, in that way diagnostically too, to sort of get a gauge of where a person's maybe intelligence is or the way that they see life. So if they are laughing at things and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, because I feel like I've got also a pretty broad range of, of humor. Like I can laugh, you know. So if somebody is also 
laughing something or creating jokes that are uncomfortable. I mean, a couple of times I'll have clients that have some some mood dysregulation, but also some social boundary issues. And if they're cracking jokes and I'm going, oh, this makes me uncomfortable, I can only fathom what this right. must be like for the people. I'd like. Right. So there's a lot of information that we can gather right off the bat about a person either having a sense of humor or not, and then what type of sense of humor they have. And from a, from a, so uh, assessing neurodevelopmental function, humor is a great way to obviously assess processing speed. Yep. How fast can you think on your feet? But also creativity. Mm, and, yeah. you know, to be able to, to come up with these innovative ideas in the moment. And one of the things I do, especially with younger kids, is I give them a blank piece of paper and a pen or a pencil and I say, just draw something. And I yeah. just turn my back and I just do other stuff. And what they come up with is very interesting. I mean, if, oh, yeah. they, if they come up with something silly and funny, that tells you a lot about where they are emotionally, mm-hmm. but also about their creativity and and uh, their innovative Did thinking. you Do you remember getting trained on house tree person? Oh yeah. Right? I mean, I remember seeing some of, you know, I mean, I remember my professor in grad school using it, certain people's drawings. And let, 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 so explain. That's a very simple technique. Yes. Three pieces of paper. Yep. You draw. Pencil. You could you do you could use color. If you you want. can, but I mean, I think that that yeah. So so first you get the this is the person draw draw a house. house. And mm-hmm. then you draw a tree, and then a person. Correct. And then there are all sorts of um, parameters oh, to review this to yes. analyze. It is, and we should yeah. put out there a disclaimer: this is what we consider to be projective testing. That's right. Right. So this is very interpretive. There, there's a little bit more fluidity in the interpretation. There of are these some. Types. There are some norms. There that, are. That yes. Well, it's it's research. It's research supported, empirically validated. But it's not like a right or wrong. No, this is not like an IQ inventory. test. Inventory, right? Yeah. This is not like an IQ test. But there are some very interesting things that can come out of that that you can begin to interpret about a person. Mm-hmm. I love that stuff. For sure. So, um, all right. So now, now let's flip yes. to more treatment. Right. What are some ways, or how have you fold? How do you fold humor and comedy into treatment? So, and I think like we're we're how many podcasts in, and I've probably said this every time. So, I am a DBT therapist, dialectical behavior therapy. Shout out to Marsha. Um, and there is a, a, a component of DBT therapy used that we call irreverent humor. And it is very intentionally used, but it needs to be monitored. It needs to be honed. It needs to be something that if you are not a seasoned clinician, you should probably stay away from because it is used to draw attention. Irreverent humor is used to draw attention to someone's either – irrational thinking, behavior, maybe some unhealthy choices, maybe some very stuck, like when we say somebody's thinking is stuck and they're not willing to be flexible. Um, So the problem is, is if you do not either know your client well or have a good clinical understanding of the fallout of a therapeutic relationship, right? How fundamentally important trust is between you and your client. So if you don't have that built yet and you use irreverent humor in the wrong kind of way, you can do a lot of damage. But when used appropriately and with good intention, this doesn't fall under that aggressive kind of humor that is meant to make somebody else feel bad. This is used to draw attention. This is used to sort of hone somebody in. So everybody's going to know, well... A lot of people are going to know Dr. Phil and how he right. used to go, and how's that working for you? So, like, that's an example of irreverent humor, but not really always used appropriately. Um, but you're, that could be... You're making me think of the old adage that comedy is all about timing. And, and so... That's a big part of it, right? Mm-hmm. You, if you're going to introduce that type of humor, it has to be the right timing in the therapeutic relationship. 100%. And the right, 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 right. right I'm never going to use this when I'm first meeting a client. Like, this isn't going to be – I'm not going to – because it can ring. There can be of a little bit of making fun of somebody, right? Because the hopes is how you would hope it to play out is a client says something to you. I make a little bit of an irreverent humor response, and the person then has a, a light bulb moment of like, oh – I, I like I get what you're like or you know and a lot of times they'll be like but you know I mean they'll sort of come back it's supposed to be a little bit of a jovial light manner and a lot of times I use it when the subject matter is heavy like if somebody is telling me um you know I had an adolescent client describing some pretty unhealthy behavior that they engaged in over like a long weekend so multiple 
unhealthy choices, right? So I use some irreverent humor to try to draw attention to like, wow, we made multiple unhealthy choices this weekend all in a row, you know, and that they're able to go like, oh, so heavy subject matter. I want to draw attention to the fact that there's a lot in there we need to draw attention to. But if I were to name it like that, like, oh my gosh, you made so many unhealthy choices over a four day span of time and I'm going to lose them. It's like the human, uh, the comedy is sort of allows you to come in the side door. Yeah, oh, that's a great door. way to do it. So reverent humor is meant to, again, draw attention to something really clinically important, but to do it in a way that the client can receive it. So this is sort of like I don't give a baby like a protein bar as a, as a newborn, right? We spoon feed. We take small steps. We feed it to people so they can take it in, ingest it, and use it. If I force what I'm trying to say on somebody, I'm going to lose them. Well, I, I totally see the danger that you're describing, or the 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 risks. Yes. That this. So, it, as you're tr- in the training, do you use role plays? And, yes. And, yeah, I mean, this is really something that you have to. Yeah. You get in with this clients. is something that you have to. You know, case examples. So you would read it, how it was used. You know, practicing. Um, th- yeah. I mean, and this is something that I guess takes. It's it's something that has to be honed. Mm-hmm. You know, but and I think it's something that unfortunately too you have to learn real time. Like you're going to have to try it. And have it go really poorly <laughs> one do you, time. Do you know DBT therapists who are good with irreverent humor in sessions, but they're not particularly funny people outside? Like, are there people who who get good at it just because it's scripted? And you don't have to name names. I'm just wondering. Yeah. Or, or I guess the flip side of my question is, to do this in DBT, do you have to be naturally good at humor? Do you have to have some, some game? I mean, so here's the funny thing is – I'm not in the room. Because I totally, other, I right? totally get you yeah. being good at this because you're hysterical. But I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm just wondering about other people. You know, I mean, the tough part is, is that I'm not in other people's therapy sessions. I think I'm drawing maybe an assumption, which that's like a no-no in DBT. We don't assume um, non-judgmental thinking. But I would assume that in order to use this and use it appropriately, you have to have innate understanding of humor and the ways that you can use it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I use irreverent humor with my kids. I use irreverent humor within my marriage. I use irreverent humor within my friend. I mean, it's just something that I will utilize. But I I guess I believe, just like with any sort of manualized treatment, that there are going to be things that you can pull out and use for yourself, and then there are things that are not going to work for you. Right. Um, so I would think that you would have to have a good innate sense of humor in order to use how, that. How about using humor? So, so you, you're, you're talking about a technique between you and your clients. So Correct. that direction. What about between clients, like in a marriage situation? Oh. I mean, one, like one of the ways that I use humor is by, I, I, I use it to help people relate to each other, like specifically parents to their kids. Oh, yeah. And parents to parents. And, and pointing out some of the yeah. absurdities and, 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 and bring up funny experiences that I had as a parent. So talk about that a little bit. So I think that a lot of times I will make myself the butt of a joke. So what was that? Self-deprecating? I don't know. What was that? Self-defeating. Like, self-defeating humor. To allow, especially a husband and wife, to align together against me in a session. So Interesting. if I'm poking at one of them, like if we're working on something difficult or or used in family therapy too, right? That if I'm really working on one person's kind of behavior, I will then go ahead and make myself the butter, allow them to turn around and pick on me and join together as almost like a bonding exercise to turn against me in the room. Um, and then people can laugh about that. Um, I sometimes use like really funny communication type stuff to help people join together. So when I'm doing family therapy and I really see that I've got a family that's like communication is, I mean, I sort of feel like when we talked about our family, that communication is at the core of a lot of family right. problems. But when they are particularly like the communication is running parallel, they're never running into each other in good communication. Like we'll do an exercise where we, one has a, a, a sheet of paper with a drawing on it that I've done. Usually something simple like a snowman or a house with very specific shapes. And they sit back to back and they have to describe what they see on the paper without describing what it is to the other person. The other person has to draw it based on what the other person is saying. And it's hysterical because people will think they're excellent communicators and then they just – what they're describing and then the other person is drawing never really lines up. 
right? This is kind of like the game Jimmy Fallon plays with some of his guests. Where really? They, I forget what he calls it. But where they, he has, one person's looking at something and. They have to describe it. I could see a whole range of marriage oh, therapy activities where and it's, it's all built around. Yeah. And, 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 then, and it's usually, and it's light enough Right. This is light enough that people and it, oh, people always laugh. You know, sometimes people get frustrated a little bit, mm-hmm. um, but most of the time people really, really laugh. And then we can talk about it's a great parallel for like you think you are communicating beautifully and look how much is missed, you know, for the other person or right. vice versa. Then the other person, I, I never said you couldn't stop and ask questions. I never said you couldn't go, wait a second. Can you tell me, you know, something else or describe this differently? Right. So I think there's lots of ways to use humor to teach such a wide variety of skills and tools, both with relationally to each other, to self. And you don't need to be in a session with a therapist. No. To get better at this. Not at all. I mean, if I am encouraging my clients, like if, if I'm doing, you know, family therapy and I want them to all do something together, if I want a couple to go out like on a date and do something, I mean, I'm never going to, like I'm always going to encourage them to go do something that involves humor, that involves enjoyment. Because when you're laughing and happy, what's that hysterical line from when you Legally you know Blonde? No, where no, Legally no. Blonde and Reese Weatherspoon's characters is like, you know, endorphins make people happy and happy people just don't kill other people. Like, <laughs> do you remember that line yes. where she's describing? Like, it's that idea that like if you're laughing, you're creating endorphins in your head. You know, you are creating those happy chemicals, those happy moods, and it's going to draw you into somebody else, and it's going to increase positive regard for each other, positive connection, usually lasting memories. This is where the good stuff lies. Corey's diagnosis required him to have every, yes, every bone in his body x-rayed to look for even the tiniest of tumors. This was a long and tedious process. Remember the part about him being a typical seven-year-old boy? He likes jokes about farts, barf, and penises. Once he realized that hospital gowns allow for a lovely breeze, it was game on. For at least a little while, his silliness provided an escape from all the medical procedures. And this was just the laugh mom and dad needed. In spite of dire circumstances, maintaining a sense of humor and finding moments of laughter can still be a choice that also can be contagious. Brandon Gage is our producer, Sean Beck is our sound engineer, theme music composer, and video editor. Executive producers are Dave Verhagen and Frank Askell. Contributors to this episode with Jonathan Hedley and Dave Verhagen. You'll find more practical psychology to enhance your life on our website, psychbytes.com. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at psychbytes. You can also reach us via email, podcast at psychbytes.com. Please send us questions, thoughts, and suggestions for future show topics. We are available just about anywhere you find podcasts, including Spotify, YouTube, and iTunes. Please spread the word and subscribe. Your positive ratings and reviews really help us build our audience. Until next time, I'm Craig Pullman. I'm Fights, and this is the Psych Bites Podcast.